Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our first panel session of this summit. Um, our panel sessions are going to be really hard to beat the ski day we just had, because that was a real good day. Um, that was a real good day. And we've actually now strung together a number of real good days. But boy, maybe it's because I skied longer today. I, I just I wasn't looking at my phone and you know if you don't look at the phone then the emails you can't you can't see what you should be doing so uh, what a fun day skiing with a bunch of different people and uh, boy that was a memorable one for me so thank you uh, those who skied with me today um, and if I took photos of you today remind me of that and we'll go through on my phone and see because I'm I was telling some people I'm a better photographer than Luke but I work only on my phone, whereas he brings the cameras that are big and clunky and it takes a long time to set up. So um, he's pretty good, but I, I have my niche uh, in the phot photographic world. Um, okay, our, okay, our business tonight is uh, we are going to talk a little bit how we think about reviewing gear and kind of our process. Um, I guess I should disclose, we don't really have, for all the different templates we use at Blister uh, for everything, basically, where we don't have a template is telling our own reviewers like the process that they should use to go out and formulate their impressions of what a product does or doesn't do and how it works and who's it for. And um, I don't know, maybe that's something we need to think about, but I, next year. Next year. Um, and so given that, um, maybe, it comes, maybe that comes out in part once we get into the review process because then we get real particular and demanding about formulations and the like. But I thought, you know, for those of you who maybe don't spend <laughs> as much time as some of us do getting on different product and writing very long reviews about it, I thought it might be helpful to hear from some of our folks um, some of the things that they're thinking about or some of the tips or tricks that have been useful for them to try to formulate assessments of all of these different pieces of equipment. So um, that's our work here today. We did this same panel session at Summit A with different reviewers, and I think what we may end up doing is chopping together a bit of a video to just, you know, get more of our people answering this, this question. So uh, we'll do that um, and then open it up to you to see what questions you might have for us or some questions that arose today as you were out, you know, spending time on different different gear. So. Kristen, would you like Luke to start? I would love it. <laughs> okay, good. Um, Luke, why don't you tell us a little bit about either your approach or do you have a favorite thing you think about or do uh, in this world? One of the first things that, or one of the most obvious things for me is what sort of skiing stance a given ski encourages, and that kind of dictates how I'm going to ski it going forward. So that's what I want to figure out first. And that's something that's most impacted, I'd say, by mount point. Um, if you've never been on a more forward mounted ski, it's probably going to feel pretty different at first. And you're probably not going to be leaning into the front of your boots and the front of the ski quite as much and vice versa for a ski that's mounted way further back. Um, so that's one of the first things that I focus on. And it's usually one of the first things to stand out. Um, kind of just figuring out where I'm putting my weight bias and figuring out w how the ski wants me to ski it. Um, that's pretty vague, but, uh, yeah, what sort of stance typically like either really aggressively forward or really centered and not much pressure on your boots. Uh, that's one of the first things I look for. Kristen. Uh, I think one of the first things I do is usually just go right onto a groomer and just see how the turn initiation is and everything like that, how intuitive it feels, um, just so I can be more comfortable going on steeps. A, l a lot of times, I, I mean, reviewing's really hard. Like, Luke, you guys do such a great job. I, I struggle with it quite a bit, but I'm always trying to figure out, like, 
why is my turn different on this ski than that ski? Is it mm. me? Am I not strong enough for the ski? Or is it because something like with the tail is throwing me off? So just constantly like, and I'm constantly trying to improve my skiing too. So it's like this huge balance, like trying to figure out all the little details of it. So it's kind of. Hmm. So that was interesting. So, but in short, you were saying you like to start on groomers, get start getting your baseline there before you. Yeah, yeah. I'm usually on, sorry. I, no, it's, I I'm went, like, that I seems so much smarter than what I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, no, just, I think I learned that from you before I was reviewing. Like, you're like, hey, guys, I want to go on a groomer. We're like, uh, yeah, cool. <laughs> we're going to go over here. We'll meet you at the lift. We're like, why does he keep going on groomers um, before I was reviewing? And now I get it. It's like, I don't want to just be thrown on something if I don't know how I'm going to initiate that turn. So maybe you should go back to that I think I've gotten braver or dumber <laughs> um yeah probably dumber because increasingly wow I've totally gotten away from my groomer first and it could just be like the lead into a, a different run right like a yeah. half groomer into the steeps or something but yeah I, except no no normally I just go straight to head wall these days and then we start figuring things out there I don't like that any I, I thank you for this I'm going to reassess what I've been doing um, what she just said makes a ton of sense, actually, I think. And, um, and it can be actually quite scary. I mean, we've got, you know, some eye opening terrain around here and, you know, I guess I probably have been more fortunate that because in the past there have been some skis when I get on something and I'm like, it's hooking up far more than I wanted to, or there have been real issues with the tune of a ski and there can be times where that can actually be fairly high consequence. So this is, this has been helpful. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that Paul Ford said the other night, like he's taken skis for the first time on a heli drop, like, yeah. <laughs> like big terrain. You're like, Oh, that's not my stuff. <laughs> yeah. Sasha. Um, I'm not as mathematical as Luke about it. Um, and I'm not as pragmatic about Kristen about it. <laughs> I kind of am with you, but I think I try to go to like, a run that I um, know really, really well, and a run that I've taken many, many skis down before so that um, I can kind of isolate the terrain out of how that ski is. And um, I think for me, um, I, I, I just try to get kind of like the, um, see how intuitive the ski is and then go from there. So maybe I should be more pragmatic as well and try a groomer, but I then I kind of go back once I'm usually on headwall type stuff or, or whatever run I'm at, wherever I'm at, um, and then kind of retreat on the groomer. And or if I can't figure anything out or I'm having a hard time with this ski, then I kind of get on that groomer and try to uh, figure out where where I'm having that problem or what I'm, what I'm having a hard time with. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think related to that, and I, I said this uh, on our last panel session, but um, I really do like my kind of reference runs, my reference lines. And, um, and so the fact is when I just was saying like, yeah, I, maybe I have gotten away from like starting on groomers, I usually am dropping in a line that I do know pretty well, or at least I know what the conditions are. I probably skied it the day before. Um, and it's very different. I find it a lot scarier if I'm skiing a ski f or a boot for the first time um, in a place I don't know, that feels a lot riskier to me. Um, but just, I mean, people who skied with me today know, like I developed my playlist of favorite, favorite lines. And uh, I think that, you know, if I had something practical to say to those of you here, um, as you get to know this mountain a bit, if you're like, man, I really enjoyed you know, the lower section of international or this left side of head wall or whatever, and you're hopping on to a new ski, go back to those hits and you know the terrain, you knew what the conditions were like, and that can provide a pretty quick reference point of, oh, um, I felt more solid on that thing I was just on, or this feels more stable or more maneuverable. Um, those kinds of things can be pretty helpful. I feel like that one might be pretty intuitive the like go ski lines, you know, but, um, I like that one. Luke, I think as a general point, um, just controlling variables where you can, 
Um, cause if you think about it, it's kind of like a science experiment trying to figure out what the ski is doing and skiing has a lot of variables, but if you can be in the same boots, um, ideally, or just focusing on what the conditions are like, are these super similar to when I skied this previous ski? Are they super different? Um, and just kind of keeping all those things in mind, um, goes a long way <clears throat> and yeah, having a reference run, um, that's kind of how I approach it typically, depending on what ski I'm on. Like I wouldn't, I usually go up to big shoot and then paradise. I wouldn't do that on a dedicated carving ski, but if I know the ski is supposed to be in kind of all mountain category, I just ski something I know and then kind of branch out from there, try and get it into a wide variety of conditions, maybe ski it in terrain that you wouldn't normally ski. Um, and the more, more situations you can test it in, the more you'll learn. Kristen, any other things you think about when you're out testing a ski? No, I think I, I jumped the gun on that one with um, just trying to evaluate how my skiing's different because of the ski or if it's because of me in that train. But yeah, I, I like the reference runs. Um, but yeah, I'm always trying to improve my skiing. So it's hard when you have a turn that you're like, wait, my tail just clipped. Like what was going on there? Is that something I wasn't paying attention to in the bump or is that like a stiff tail pushing me back or something like that. So yeah, the controlling the variables is very key. So. Mm -hmm. Or the flip obviously of what you two were talking about is if you are taking out a new boot, ideally you're not also on a new ski, right? Um, yeah. Sasha, what else? Um, you know, I think I'm pretty guilty of this. I think I caught myself doing this today, but not being so quick to judge it, being like, I like it or I hate it, right? Like. Um, not even letting yourself do that, um, that's certainly something that I'm working on and being like, okay, instead of doing that, like think a little bit harder, use some bigger bigger thoughts or vocab, like what, what are you liking, what are you not liking? Um, but yeah, I think, I think just being patient with it, I think that's really important. I think a lot of us do like, oh, I hate this, put this, get this away, I need a new ski, right? I need a different length or whatever it is. Um, but really spend time and like Kristen says, like, okay, the tail is doing it this and, you know, trying to figure out exactly what you are feeling versus this is something I prefer or I don't prefer. Mm. And, and a lot of people might, well, I mean, I'm sure like the more intuitive skis really sell better, right? Because you get on them and you, you can ski them like one run. You're like, oh, this seems great. I'm going to buy this. But the ones that are harder to try and the ones you have to figure out why this is doing it, as you're trying to figure that out, you can adjust your skiing a little bit and might make you a better skier at certain things because of it. So, um, and also like Sasha said, not just dismissing it right off the bat, like, oh, this didn't do what I wanted. I'm done with it. So like work into it, figure out what you can do to change your position, like body position or anything like that to make that ski work for you or try a different length. Or try the one, you know, without metal in it or something like that instead of dismissing a whole line of skis or a whole brand of skis. I'm actually, we're going to open this up to questions pretty quickly here, I think. But um, one of the things I wanted to address at least is, you know, um, <laughs> I say this to every one of our reviewers and certainly as we're kind of onboarding reviewers um, we have a phrase, uh, I say, no narcissistic reviewers. And I also will tell people like, I actually don't care what you or you or you think about a ski. The only thing I care about is your ability to articulate to say 50,000 people or 100,000 people reading one of our reviews. Are you able to provide enough information to let people from all around the world who we don't know um, of all different ability levels, can you provide enough and the right information to let every one of those people get to the bottom of that review and think that sounds like a product that would be really good for me or like, yeah, that's definitely not a product for me, right? That's how we do things. So that whole question of who's it for and are you good enough at articulating the nuances of these products to provide that information? That's what I actually care about, right? And I realize that's pretty different from, you know, those of you who are here, like, that's cool. I'm not trying to tell the world what they should think of this ski. I'm trying to figure out like what works well for me. 
And I think that's an interesting question. I think it is kind of opposite. The mission is opposite. And yet, and here's maybe a question I'll pose to everybody, there might be something to the idea of if you're skiing big shoot, you know, you skied it today or you ski it tomorrow on a new ski and you don't click with it or maybe you absolutely love it, maybe there is value in still thinking about I wonder who would really jive with this product and that maybe that process you can then kind of extrapolate back from that to help you think about what do I actually value or don't care about, right? Whether it's in a ski or a ski boot or jacket or whatever. Um, have, you, have you guys thought about that much or what do, you, do you have a take on that? Well, I mean, that's one of our questions in the gear review form is who, who's a ski for, right? So. Yeah, I think like just trying to step outside of your own <clears throat> own personal perspective, it helps. Like I think it helps when you're getting on new skis, just trying to th- figure out who would, if even if I don't, or um, I really like this ski. Why is that? Um, I think stepping out of yeah, you can get into a rhythm of like, I know exactly what I want to ski. Um, I know about the or like what those sort of skis are. But yeah, trying to figure out who would, I think you can kind of backstep from that and then narrow in on like, I really didn't like this ski. And actually I think it's because it's got a really flat tail or it's really stiff. And then you can go back to the booths and have some information like, hey, I just skied this. I wasn't a huge fan. I think it's because of this and this. Uh, what do you have that might uh, be better? Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's a, a good thought exercise for anyone. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, it's intimidating, right? You have all these skis, you have all these lengths, you have all these widths. Um, the process is really intimidating. So I think getting as much information that you can from, um, you know, the, the people who've designed it, who, we have that luxury here. Um, and then, yeah, if you aren't jiving with it or you really are, you can be like, yeah, like this ski is very suited for somebody who prefers the same type of terrain that I do. Or if you are finding something that you aren't jiving with, that I think is a really great opportunity to step outside of um, kind of your ego and be like, okay, well, who would this be good for? Um, and I think that that is uh, probably one of our most important roles as reviewers, but it is challenging. It, it's hard to you know step back and, and, and really think about, okay, this is gonna be good for this type of person or this type of train or whatever. Uh, last question, and then we'll open it up to you guys. Uh, this got, posed to us, this question got posed to us in our last summit, how much information do we want? How much information do we go get about a product before we go spend time on it? And um, I want to hear how you all are thinking about this, but I, I said that this has, I think, changed quite a bit for me over the years These days, I come in pretty blind. I don't know the mount points of the ski I'm getting on. I don't know the weight. I don't know the stated side cut radius. I kind of just want to go ski and start figuring things out from there. And, you know, again, since our whole deal is not so much like what do I personally dig, but like who is this ski for and how does it want to be skied or what is this ski boot doing? Um, you know, answering those questions. Um, I think I've changed in my approach. Um, I think, you know, earlier in the history of blister, I got a lot of information before I got on the mountain and I've switched up quite a bit and, um, and have, you know, sometimes get quite surprised, but mostly I guess just go do the work and start doing that work of adjusting each run and, and then go back and look at the numbers or put the thing on a scale. And sometimes I am surprised by those results. Um, but do you guys have a preference? I, yeah, I, I, I can see the ski, that's about it. I don't look at the numbers or weights or anything like that either. I, I imagine, well, Luke does all of that, so I imagine he comes in with a little bit more knowledge. Well, Dylan's been helping with the specs lately, so mine's like a 50-50 mix. I usually, at the very least, know from the manufacturer what the ski is supposed to do. Um, and then like half the skis I've at least weighed and probably hand flexed. 
um, and then half. I've been going blind into a decent amount now that Dylan's doing the specs. Yeah. Um, I do like to play the guessing game of how much does the ski weigh and like what's the mount point if I don't know all those things, which is a very boring game to play, but <laughs> getting pretty good at it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I also mount most of our skis, so I at least know the mount point on most of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's an interesting experience. I think it's particularly fun to get on something I don't know anything about. Um, sometimes that goes well, sometimes it goes poorly, but um, yeah, I, I do it both ways these days and don't notice like a, a huge difference in how I approach the review. I think I go in pretty blind, wouldn't you guys say? <laughs> in most things, yes. <laughs> I do pay attention to width for sure. But one of the <clears> coolest <throat> things that, um, uh, especially like this week that we've been able to do, or, or I have, is get on skis that um, Luke, Jonathan, Dylan have gotten on, and we just haven't had access to those skis this week, and then go blind, ski them, and then be like, oh, that was interesting. I felt this in there, and then grab the buyer's guide and be like, how off am I? And then there is like, oh, you know, and, and have the exact same shared experience with, um, you know, exactly the rest of the team. So I think that's pretty cool hmm. for sure. So do you all have questions um, either about how we do things at Blister or things, questions that came up today uh, or just general questions about getting on a bunch of new equipment? So the question was, what are some of our individual preferences when it comes to skis and boots? Lucas. Uh, well, one thing that's kind of evolved as, during my time at Blister is I've been able to try a lot of different skis. So my preferences have definitely diversified over the years. Um, and it depends a whole lot on what sort of category I'm looking at. Like for a general all mountain ski, I value something that lets me ski pretty centered. So I tend to like things that are mounted, not like not like minus 10. There aren't a ton of skis I like that are mounted that far back. Um, I appreciate a fairly soft tail because I get back seat a lot. Um, I like something that's very easy to release and pivot in the tight terrain that Crested Butte's famous for. But at the same time, I also appreciate something that's got pretty good suspension and it is pretty stable to the point where I don't mind bringing it out like two weeks ago when it hadn't snowed in a month and a half. Um, so it's kind of a mix of many different categories. Um, I guess that'd probably be the most succinct way to describe some very complex uh, preferences. As far as boots, it, all I need it to do is fit my foot, which is impossible. Is about, like I think two boots I've ever tried on did that. Huh. And I'm in one of them now, or was today. <laughs> Sasha? Um, I, it's, it depends, right? Uh, it depends on what you're skiing, where you're skiing. Um, I think for me, um, I'm not very big as well-established here. Um, so, But I, I like to have a damp and stable ski, so I kind of have I, – I like to have a light, uh, fairly lightweight ski, but, but it's still – I don't – I like to still have a, quite a bit of stability. Um, for all mountain Colorado skiing, I tend to s prefer wits in the 104, but again, I, I could, you know, spend a month or two on a ski, you know, in the low 90s. So I really just think it depends. Um, as for boots, um, any boot I can get my hand on that's a 22 or 22.5, which is quite a feat. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I do have a small narrow foot, so... Um, that plays into it a little bit, but there's some pretty good boot fitters that have some shims that can do some good work. So, yeah. Uh, I. She asked, "What boot would you recommend for that size?" Did <laughs> 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 no, great. Um, uh, so I think uh, there's a lot. Of, I think what's going to happen is before the pandemic, there was a lot of discussion so I heard about offering boots um, the whole line down to a 22 but I think with materials and and the pandemic delays I'm not quite sure where we are in that process um, I was in an atomic hawk for a good four years um, three years four years and and that was that was like a, a glass slipper I put that boot on and I didn't have to do very much with it so yeah and our next panel session 
on ski boots. We'll talk a bit more about precisely this issue. Good news for people with small feet. Think the world is changing uh, in, in the right direction. So, yeah. Oh, and I don't like boots that have are low cuff. So hopefully we'll be able to get some news whether or not um, they tended uh, women specific boots for um, the past maybe five, 10 years tended to shorten the cuff quite a bit. Um, and that gave me awful boot bang. And so that was then a little bit tricky to find a short boot, like a 22, 22 five with a higher cuff. That was almost like an impossible equation. So. Hmm. <laughs> Kristen. Uh, so I think I overuse this word all the time, but I really like skis that are intuitive. I want it to disappear underneath me right away. How do I describe that? These are also like the hardest ones to, to write about because you're like, but wait, what does it do? It just did it. I don't know what it just did, but it did it right. Like, um, so very intuitive, like maneuverable, but stable. Um, generally not super heavy, stiff. I don't like have a lot of power when I ski. I try to finesse the turns more than anything else. Um, I tend to prefer, like I used to be like all 110 size kind of wasted, but lately I've really been liking 94 to 96 range. Um, but it, a lot of it like, like I'm not as strong this year as I was last year, just because I got a little lazy in the preseason. Um, and this whole event takes yeah, a lot of you had hours. A, you had a little going on. So if you see me ski, give me a little, you know, slack on that one. So, um, but yeah, so generally just intuitive, and uh, it does play a factor in how strong my legs feel and how my confidence is. For boots, um, I have a foot that pretty much fits every boot, but one brand where the ankles don't like, like my ankles don't like them, but. Uh, generally like a 120 flex, um, like 98 millimeter wide kind of thing. So yeah, pretty easy on boots, but. Um, some of you have heard this. Uh, I, I, I tend to be a defender of weight. Uh, I like weight in a ski and in a ski boot. Um, I think for given that I, y'all skied where I ski, um, you know, you're sometimes banging out turns and trying to find lines where they don't really exist. Or, you know, I need to make, I need to straight line this 20 feet and bang one turn or things are gonna go real badly right now. And I think um, I tend to prefer slightly heavier or more than slightly heavy products where I'm willing and happy to provide more physical input myself and if you can get to not super skiing super fast, but you know, get some speed going, um, I'm happy to then provide that input. But I feel more confident in general, especially thinking about inbounds gear, um, on heavier products that do offer this word we use a lot at Blister um, that offer good suspension, that there, where there's good damping, where when we're just you're hammering into you know, maybe skiing some amazing soft moguls and then you hit that one very firm one um, where there's just sort of more impact absorption um, and sort of smoothing out of rough terrain. So, um, you know, I, I still tend to skew a bit toward heavier ski boots and, uh, and heavier skis, though I have also acknowledged and we talked about this last panel session on ski design, which you all will see the video that comes out from that, that I think lightweight, lighter weight gear and just lightweight gear is becoming more capable than it's ever been. So I don't love saying that because I'm not trying to get the industry to go back to being like, cool, like let's just keep going lighter and lighter and lighter. But I think um, it, even at this summit, I've been on some products where um, – the gear is simply getting lighter and more capable than it was five years ago, certainly 10 years ago. Um, so yeah, but anyway, weight's pretty cool. Don't be afraid of heavier stuff sometimes. Sure. What do you think the average consumer can get out of the demo process? So the question was, what do we think the average consumer can get out of the demo process? Um, I think the way we're doing demos is um, with that our uh, summit gear review form, you really get an understanding of what type of skier you are. So you have an understanding of what you want to talk to a brand about 
and see if they have a recommendation? Are you just more knowledgeable and saying, you know, I skied this or I, I, I've never liked that brand, but I skied this right now and it seems fine. You know, so having the dialogue there to really, um, yeah, work it out on your own instead of relying on somebody else really. But, and, and being able to just um, test it and like maybe you always ski to 176 and it always mm-hmm. felt maybe like mm-hmm. a little overwhelming, but now you can try just that shorter size or that longer size, yeah. you know, like you have options here and it's not like you have to go through a whole process at a shop to, um, not that there's anything wrong with going through the process at a shop, but um, it's just easier just go grab it, switch it out and try that other one in that length and mm-hmm. see what you think. Yeah, I think mostly it's just like <clears throat> for future ski purchases, you're just narrowing down your op- your good options. And just like if you've been on the same ski for five years uh, and all of a sudden you s- ski like a dozen skis over the next few days, next time you purchase a ski, you, you're like, I don't even have to look at this category or this group of skis. Um, and I think it will just make it a lot easier um, going forward, just kind of figuring out what you like. Yeah, I'd agree. Like a point of reference, um, I think that's really important. Being able to compare apples to apples, if you talk about width or um, length, like Kristen mentioned. Um, But it's rarely an opportunity, I don't think, nowadays to go out and demo five skis in a similar width category and then compare like what one ski did versus the other and how it felt against the other. So I think getting that point of reference and getting to compare them all, I, I think that's a huge advantage. I also want to add one more thing. Um, it's also a place where you can get out of your comfort zone. If you think mm-hmm. you like a certain ski, now's a chance to try a different one. Like my husband used to think like, oh, I can, any ski's fine. And he jumped on a different ski, thanks to him. Mm-hmm. And his skiing just like, I mean, he was a good skier to begin with. And it, he was like just blown away at how that ski changed his skiing style. So like, if you think you like that, you know, one specific category, Try something else, see what it does. You might really enjoy that. And maybe you'll think, well, okay, I tried it, I'm good, but it can be eye-opening. Two things I wanna say, uh, we had uh, an attendee at our last summit uh, who came up to me and he just said, I had no idea how different, how different skis could be. And it's like, yep, we aren't making this stuff up in all these reviews. Like when we're, when we're going on and on, there are reasons. And I thought that was really cool. This is somebody pretty new to skiing and um, he was just kind of blown away um, by just how different all of these pieces of, you know, mostly wood and p and the rest could, could be. Um, I think the other thing, and this, this, um, this one's important to me. Man, I have heard a lot over the last 11 years, people say things like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't really ski that much um, or I'm not that good at skiing, so anything is probably fine. That is 100% not true. It is absolutely true that someone might not know exactly what he or she is looking for or interested in in a ski or ski boot But I promise you, go get on three or 10 different skis or into three or 10 different ski boots. You might have no vocabulary for how to talk about these things. You will absolutely have a preference. You will feel more comfortable or less comfortable or more confident or less confident on one product than the others. So I think still we've got work to do in just getting people past the idea that the different gear or these nuances we talk about, that's only relevant to the people skiing a bunch of days of year or the very best skiers. I actually think it's reversed. The people who spend the most time skiing or maybe are at the highest level can pretty quickly adjust to almost anything. People that are still trying to get better at this sport, and by the way, we're all trying to get better at this sport, but if the newer you are in this journey, the more critical I would argue that it is to get into or on the equipment that is gonna just first first make you enjoy the experience the most. That's the thing I care about most. Um, and then second, after I'm just having a great time on the mountain, 
what then does make you feel comfortable and confident to kind of keep going? And I think one of the things we all love about this sport is just those little daily challenges. You know, I wonder if I can make that turn right over there. Um, I think that's at least a lot of the fun of the sport for me. So um, I think those are some of the things where a, an opportunity like this or demos in general are, can be super helpful and really eye-opening for people. So the question is, how long do we typically spend on a ski before we write a review? And is one set of conditions sort of adequate or sufficient to have a ski in before we write the review? I would start off by saying <clears throat> one day is extremely useful for our, when we're publishing a review, and this is Blister's opinion, and it's going out to thousands of people, we're spending many days on a, on a given product, and mostly it just depends on how long it takes to get it in a wide enough range of conditions and terrain and scenarios where I feel 100% confident that what I'm writing is true. Um, Jonathan likes to say, don't be wrong. Or, don't ever be wrong. Yeah. Um, so it's however long it takes for me to think, believe 100% that I am not wrong with what I'm writing. But on a personal level, like I'm learning a ton over the course of like two hours on a ski. Um, so yeah, it's more so like when we're publishing a finalized review, yeah, it's much more in depth and done over a long period of time. But yeah, getting any run on any ski, you learn something. And I would, I would say maybe just to go more concrete, I'd say most of the reviews we're putting out, we will, most of the reviews will have at least two reviewers chiming in on a product. And that's one of the things we love to do. And there are some products where we'll get five or six different people in on that ski before it goes out. And, and then on reviews like that, I mean, it's five or six different people sometimes uh, with a collect a total collective of 30 40 50 days which is wildly different uh from my understanding still on how the vast majority of the uh ski review world kind of operates um it's a it's a lot of time and um anyway let me do you do we have other thoughts on the the time question Sasha? I mean, I think Luke is 100% right. Like, it just depends on how lucky we are with, like, the conditions and um, how many days we can get there in the different conditions. Um, and then uh, kind of going back to what Jonathan said here, yeah, I think for us, uh, we are just now starting to, to put in – uh, reviews where Kara will get on a ski, Kristen will get on a ski, and I'll get on a ski. And I think that's something that I'm really excited about that, that we're going to hopefully start moving towards um, because we are very different sized people, the three of us. Um, and we ski somewhat differently, somewhat the same. Um, but it's so interesting to see where we have a very similar experience and where we have a totally different experience. And I think that's really valuable to the audience and, and the reader of the review. So I'm really excited that we'll be kind of moving in that direction as well. And hopefully getting to do different sizes, um, a longer version and a shorter version. And then that way we kind of really can, can give a much better perspective on a ski or... And one of the last things I'll say is um, when we happen to get on a product that Kristen has, we've used the word intuitive a decent amount on this panel. Um, when we get on a ski and it's like, yep, this is kind of point and shoot. We get right away what it's doing. That is again, in terms of we've talked already about, we need to establish that confidence that when we publish that review, we're ready to defend the position and when a product is just really intuitive, actually that's sometimes when we will like put less time on the product before we publish the review. We have a very like right now situation where there's a ski that Luke and Dylan Wood and myself have spent, I've now spent a ton of time on this thing. Luke and Dylan were feeling confident about where they were with this ski, and they actually went ahead and published a, the review, and I just said, I'm not ready to weigh in yet. So we published it, and I have been spending more time on this product, 
A, B, seeing it against a number of other skis in multiple lengths. And it's just that thing that don't ever be wrong. And I, there's a couple things that just still feel off to me about the product. And before I stay, before I say that, I just want to be ready to defend. And, um, but this is one where I'm in a little bit of disagreement with Luke and Dylan, and that's okay. Um, some people probably read our reviews and this was always the idea from the beginning. Some people might resonate or feel like their ski style or the skis I tend to like that resonates a bit more with who you are. Some people will resonate more with the kind of skis that Luke gets excited about or the things that he prioritizes more than I do. And that's what I always wanted in this. We don't have to have absolute consensus among the team. Let people that are good at this weigh in. We'll have a few of us then saying, well, you know, Luke talked about a certain ski was absolutely stable enough for him. And I'm like, mm, you know, maybe not so much. And by doing that kind of triangulation, the, hopefully the old end goal is we've helped people get a better sense of where their priorities are and the things they're looking for in a product to help them, again, get to that answer of, is this a product that is going to work well for me? The question was, how much does a binding per, uh, affect the performance of a ski? And there was a second part of the question that just made this an easier answer. Um, if, for example, we put a pin binding on a ski rather than the alpine demo bindings that many of us have been skiing today, will we notice a performance difference? Can I just layer a demo binding on top of a regular alpine binding difference in that question as well? Um, you totally just messed up the repeat the question process. Uh, <laughs> Um, let's, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, let me take this to try to move quickly. Um, pin binding versus alpine binding, you're going to notice a substantial difference, full stop. I'm going to like, I'll defend that position to the death. Those are such radically different products. There is no pin binding on the market that skis like an alpine binding. Um, there is a range, there, there is a range of pin bindings, so they're not all identical, but we are in two different worlds here. And we spend a lot of time on blister trying to like get people to appreciate that point, right? Both the downhill performance of a pin binding and some of the safety features that are not present in a pin binding versus a good Alpine binding. So Alpine binding versus pin binding, big difference. Uh, expect a big difference. Now, question of demo alpine binding versus non-demo alpine binding, we addressed exactly this question in the panel session we did um, at Summit A in our session on binding. So um, stay tuned for that video. It was a really good conversation, I think. But let's see what these folks say. Like, Yeah, I agree with everything you said. I think the Part of the question uh, was about like if you ski this week something on an alpine binding and you're thinking about buying it and putting pin bindings on it, if you love that ski with an alpine binding, I have pretty high confidence you'd like it with a pin binding. It would feel different, but not radically. Not, like, like the ski itself is still going to be the ski. Um, so it's more about like the connection to it and the, I mean, the suspension of an alpine binding is very different than a pin binding. But yeah, if you love a ski with an alpine binding, I think you're still going to get along with it qu at least quite well with the pin binding, but it will feel different. What about the question of, and again, we've got a video for you that it will drop um, soon on this, the question of alpine demo binding versus dedicated alpine binding. Have you all, you all have spent time on both. Have you noticed much of a difference in the real world when you're out on the mountain difference between the two? I think it's weight for me. I'm so sensitive to weight. Um, I think it's really just the added weight of the demo binding. Um, perhaps that can be helpful with a little person. Maybe, you know, if you're, if it's the ski is already pretty heavy and you're having a hard time maneuvering it around, that would be where that might make a difference. But I don't think 
generally speaking, I because I do have skis that are not demo, um, not demo bindings, and I and I don't feel like there's a huge difference, other than the weight. Um, to start off with demo binding versus alpine binding, I spend most of my time on demo binding, so I'm very accustomed to them. Um, the differences that I've heard other people talk about, I don't tend to notice very much. Um, I've, the main complaint I hear is that the pl long plates create a dead spot in the middle of the ski. The vast majority of the skis, I don't think I'm really bending that part of it. Um, so maybe that's why I don't notice it too much. But personally, I can hop on demo regular alpine bindings and not really think about them at all. Um, yeah, I don't notice much of a difference at all. Nothing to add. Um, I've spent enough time on the same ski mounted with um, a non-demo alpine binding and a demo binding. To me, the differences have been marginal um, to non-existent, to be honest. We get into this in our binding panel session. Um, there are some people who disagreed vehemently with this with this take, but I mean, the fact is we might be skiing a broader range of skis with a broader range of bi bindings than most people on earth. And, uh, you know, just our take, but I think that can be overstated, um, the difference between the two. Um, in terms of system bindings, usually system bindings are coming on such a specific class of skis we're usually into carving, dedicated carving skis um, that um, we maybe have not, you know, and, and often those skis sometimes aren't even available flat, right, where you're adding whatever binding you want. So um, that feels like a bit of a different beast that I'm not sure we're in the best position to really say something too helpful on. Anything else? Yeah. So the question was, when we get a ski that's marketed as unisex, um, how much agreement or disagreement do we tend to get about that ski between our male and female reviewers? Um, I'd say it goes back and forth. It depends on the ski. Some of them, um, I'll be talking to Luke about what I just experienced with the ski I was on. He's like, yeah, that's, that's what we're feeling too. I'm like, Okay, cool. And then I'll say something else about I'm like um, about a different ski, and it it seems sometimes to me it's like my lack of power say will give me a different experience, and that's when I have to ski and ski and ski and try to be powerful, and then I can kind of understand where they're coming from. But my experience is very different on that ski. Is that? Mm. I think it depends a bit too. Often we're skiing like I'm skiing a longer version of the same ski, and you're skiing a shorter version. Um, and I'd agree with what you said there. Uh, we, we haven't had a ton of skis where we ski them in the same exact length just because we're skiing different lengths generally. Mm -hmm. But um, the handful of times we have had been able to do that, it's generally pretty similar feedback, especially like Kara and I are pretty similar sized. We're usually very much on the same page. Yeah, and I would agree. I think um, more, more than like Kara and Luke are certainly taller people. <laughs> yeah, everybody. that's the first time I've been called tall. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. Um, but I'm actually surprised more so than I would think. And I say that after spending a bit of time on a unisex ski over the past two days and then kind of verifying um, what what my experience was and it having be very similar to, to you know, Luke's experience. So, hmm. Other question? Yeah. So the question is, what are our personal thoughts on ski lengths? And then how does that factor into how we advise other people when they're trying to find the right length for them? Um, for me personally, it depends on so many things. We have a very long article on our website about how to think about ski length, and it lists all the factors, or pretty much all of them. Um, so it depends a ton on what type of ski it is. If it's a skinny carver that has no rocker, full effective edge, is really heavy, I'm going to ski that much shorter than any of my all-mountain or powder skis. And the opposite for 
fat skis that are super rockered, short effective edge, maybe it's lighter, I'm going to go significantly longer. So I think for the skis I personally enjoy, range anywhere from like 177 to 190 plus. Um, so it just depends on what the ski is. And then as far as advising people on length, the very first question I ask is what are you on right now and what length is it? And has it ever felt particularly long or short? And then just going from there, cause like without a reference point, it's very challenging. Um, but if I know that this person skied a 180 centimeter Solomon QST 106, and it either felt too long or too short, I can go from there and be, feel pretty confident about what lengths to recommend for given skis. Yeah, Yeah, I would just add um, about their skiing style too, because it's not just one length for every skier by the height, weight, and what they've skied before, because there's skis that I like in two lengths for d two different reasons. Like, am I gonna be out there hopping around doing, you know, bumps and stuff like that, or do I wanna really try to charge it down the mountain more, so. Yeah, it, it, it can be tricky, but that's like with the Blister membership, that's how we go through the process and ask them as much as we can about their skiing preferences and size and athletic ability and all sorts of stuff. So, Yeah, yeah I think it really it, it depends on what your experience, like what kind of experience you're looking for. I think my strongest opinion on it is you can't hang your hat on the size charts. A hundred percent. Yeah, We've, we have fought so hard for years to get people to ignore the vast majority of size charts out there. And, um, you know, w one of the things that I want to underscore too is what Luke said, do not marry a ski length number. You do not have one number. Not when you start skiing a range of skis. Luke mentioned sort of 177 to 190s, and I mean, one of my favorite skis in the world is 194 centimeters long. There are certain front side scar carvers that I'm skiing in a 173, poss possibly a bit uh, shorter than that. So that is probably a basic thing that we need to say more about. Um, and in that article, which I'm pretty proud of, that how to think about ski length, I think we at least have gone a Gonna, done a pretty good job at sort of appropriately complicating that question, but too many people are like hung up on a specific length. I think that's changing a bit. We got, we heard that a lot more, I think in the early days of Blister than we do these days. Um, but it was explaining when rockered skis were, you know, that was less of a thing 10 years ago than it is now. And just helping people understand that you can get on these longer skis and they still turn really easily. And by getting on that longer ski that still turns really easily, you gain stability in addition to maneuverability. I, I feel like at least in the people we talk to from, and frankly, that's from all around the world. Um, I feel like there's, that's we're we're spending less time trying to make that clear, but um, yeah, don't get married to a number. And, and truly, that's, yeah, I'd say my range is pretty much in the, call it 170 to 196, you know? But, and that's moving front side typically to kind of big mountain stuff. All right, we'll wrap this up. Um, yeah, maybe this is our last question here. So the question is, are ski manufacturers typically trying to achieve a similar feel from the shortest lengths of a ski model to the longest lengths of a particular model. Um, is there a kind of general approach to that? Um, well, I think on the ski design panel from yeah. this past one, we keep mentioning all these ones that you guys didn't get to see, but you will. Um, they talked a lot about that. And lot. yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna speak for them, but yeah, the goal is for if you ski a 163, ski uh, model A and a 190 for the people that are going to be skiing those lengths they should they, they want them to feel similar except so I, I would not actually I wouldn't I, Luke's gonna agree with me when I say this but some do that some are looking for a kind of uniform feel across the length spectrum but 
it has certainly been a thing in the past. I feel like maybe we're seeing this less today where the longest length of a ski, sometimes it would be called like an, the athlete build, the longest length would actually be beefed up intentionally. And so say a 184 centimeter length of a ski would feel one way. And if you went to a 190 or a 191, it was going to feel like noticeably more ski. But if we're, you know, we're always interested in kind of identifying trends. I'd say I'm, I think there's less of that out there today than maybe there was five to 10 years ago. And there, so it might be more today that brands are trying to hit that uniform feel. Yeah, I'd say it's pretty rare where we get on two lengths and one feels disproportionately different. Um, usually it's just like, yeah, feels like a longer version of that shorter ski. But we do try to point out then in our reviews when we do feel like, oh, this jumping from say a 177 to a 184 does feel a bit disproportionate. Um, that's something that we've actually, we, it's another thing over the, the history of what we've been doing. It's become more common for us to review a ski in multiple lengths and it, precisely for this reason, like we'll, we'll drop like an 8,000 word ski review and we kind of joke about this, except it's not a joke. We'll like work our asses off, you know, on this thing, get it polished, publish it, you know, first question, great review. What about this next length? The, the one bigger, the one, and we're just like, can we kill it? Like we should stop doing this, but, but it makes sense. Right. And so we are more frequently now weighing in on a couple lengths. And there are times where if you read some of my reviews, I try to provide caveats where, Hey, you know, I think most people could be happy, say, with a 177 in this particular ski, even if they're used to skiing that and maybe a 184 mid-180 ski. But that mid-180 gets to be a lot of ski uh, for people in this category. So we, we do our best to try to weigh in on those things. But so few caveats to complicate that answer. So the question is, how much do skis tend to vary um if we had pick your ski imagine it in your head something you skied today if we had 12 of those exact same ski exact same length how much consistency should we expect to see from one the first model to the 12th model we haven't been able to do that with a lot of skis but we did when we did our lightweight touring binding shootout we had i think five or six pairs of a solomon mountain explorer 95 all on a 184 centimeter length between all those pairs there was like i think a 50 to 75 gram difference uh between in an individual ski across the board but we skied them all back to back i can't say i noticed any one pair feeling feeling heavier or feeling lighter um i'd be curious to hear uh, some manufacturers talk about it because there's always going to be some sort of manufacturing tolerances, but in that one case, they all felt like the same ski. I think that's about the best we can, best we can, the most we can say on that for now. So anyway, Hey, good questions. Thank you. Um, we will say, um, I want to say one thing about our summit gear review form. Um, so have, have, most of you, all of you had a chance to look at this yet. We talked about it last night at the welcome session. And again, we want to continue to remind people, this is a really significant component um, of this summit uh, for the reasons I kind of mentioned last night, but uh, please take a look at it. We mentioned at the top, um, you know, take a photo of the ski you're taking out for the day or enter it on your phone. Um, what length, the model, the brand. Um, and we sure hope to get some really good feedback from all of you on the equipment that you're spending time on. And like we said, I think it's going to be a really cool iteration of Blister that, you know, you'll get our take on a number of these products, but where we can establish or see a kind of consensus uh, from you all about some of these products, we're going to start baking that into our reviews because I think that's going to be just another meaningful 
data point for people around the world and hopefully pretty fun for all of you. And we'll, we'll be curious to see if how much agreement we're all in. And so I'm um, looking forward to uh, you doing your homework, uh, your fun work, your fun work. I made up a word. Yeah, and you, you don't have to do but it. But you do. But we you appreciate do, you doing it. But you do have to. <sighs> yeah. Um, one, one tip for that, because uh, I have a terrible memory, as it turns out. I actually do voice memos, and I'll name the ski, the length, and I'll, like, say what I feel about that ski so that when I go back to review it, I just listen to that, and I can put myself back on the slopes with that ski and just – Anyway, you don't have to do that. Just my tip on it. Um, one other logistical thing. Get you a raffle ticket tonight. We have really sweet giveaways. Well, thank you uh, for the very good questions. Uh, hopefully that was a bit helpful for what you all are going to be doing over the next couple of days. And um, it's, it's really fun for me to hear your answers uh, to some of these questions too. So um, that's a bit about how we review gear and curious to see how you all review gear. Um, so thanks a lot.